Eckernförder Naval Base. Good morning, Good morning Crew Alpha. Station. With U-32, Alpha Crew heads towards the maneuver. Crew to diving stations. The crew of the 400 million euro submarine is constantly on alert. Fire on board. Diesel engine on fire. First steps initiated. Rudder failure. Rudder failure. Steering console failed. Up to 30 people live here in the most cramped conditions for weeks on end. Some have problems with smelly feet, of course, but you just have to put up with it. The mood on board can quickly change. The food has to be good. I prepared 136 meals for the crew today. Eckernförde Naval Base in Schleswig-Holstein, the German Navy's only deep water port on the Baltic Sea. And this is where the six German Navy submarines are based. Not very many, but they're ultra modern. Besides the submariners, combat swimmers and the crews of fleet service and support boats are also based here. A total personnel of 1,900. <laughs> 8 p.m. The crew of the U-32 gather for the roll call. The submarine is to sail the following day. Commander Rudolf Lente and Lieutenant Commander Beck swear the crew in. Salute the commander. Eyes left. For Commander Lente, it's the first maneuver with this crew, which has the name Crew Alpha. The 28 members belong to the first submarine squadron Eckernförde and are part of the elite band of sailors because in the German Navy, there are only around 80 active submariners in four separate crews. The crew have been through two months of intense preparation for this maneuver. U-32 will sail from Eckernförde across the Bay of Kiel to reach the Holtenau Lock in the Kiel Fjord. The lock marks the beginning of the Kiel Canal, one of the busiest waterways in the world. After almost 100 kilometers in the narrow canal, the submarine passes through the lock at Brunsbüttel. Here, the cameras have to leave the vessel, as the U-32 is on its way to a top-secret NATO maneuver off Plymouth in southern England. U-32 is a Class 212A submarine, the world's most modern non-nuclear-powered vessel type. The hull is made of non-magnetic steel. This makes the submarine almost invisible to military tracking devices and virtually undetectable underwater, even for sonar. 1,500 tons of special steel was used. The interior is pure high-tech, much of it top secret. A submarine of this type costs around 400 million euros. In a war scenario, these torpedo tubes contain six wire-guided heavyweight torpedoes. There are 21 beds on board, and the up to 30 men and women in the crew sleep alternately in shifts. The almost two square meters of private space also have to be shared. U-32 has the NATO designation S-182. The steel colossus is 56 meters long, 7 meters wide, and 11 and a half meters high. It generates 4,240 horsepower. U-32 can dive to at least 250 meters, officially. In a defense scenario, it is armed with six torpedoes. The crew and control rooms are located in the central part of the pressurized hull. In this very limited space, the up to 30 men and women often have to live and work for several weeks. At the rear is the modern hybrid drive consisting of a diesel engine and a fuel cell. This makes the U-32 one of the quietest submarines in the world. 
The Propeller II is particularly silent. It was specially developed and is top secret. Before departure, the vessel is refueled. The fuel cell needs hydrogen and oxygen. And so the tanks are now filled with the so-called reactants. Inside the vessel, the marine engineer officer, Wiebke Ludwig, is in charge. Principally, this is where the reaction between oxygen and hydrogen takes place, from which we generate a proportion of our electricity. This box is simply covered up, and everything behind the cover is confidential. We're not allowed to talk about it, and we don't want everyone to be able to see what's installed there either. Basically, we are an electric battery-powered vessel, meaning that we draw our energy from the battery. And this battery, of course, has to be charged at some point. Principally, the propeller is powered by the battery. If outside air is available, it's operated by a generator driven by a diesel engine. When submerged and cut off from outside air, the oxygen and hydrogen in the fuel cell react. The energy this produces is again fed via the generator into the battery, which powers the submarine. This revolutionary fuel cell technology enables the U-32 to travel underwater for weeks on end. At the base, Commander Rudolf Lente is making the final preparations so that U-32 can leave port safely and on time. The 35-year-old has been the commander of Crew Alpha for only two months, and this is their first mission together. I'm responsible for overall safety. In fact, for every single life on board, my job requires full concentration because final decisions rest with me, and anything my crew does wrong ultimately falls back on me. That's why I'm extremely conscientious about double-checking everything, especially because it's the first major mission with this crew. Now, the most important thing has to be dealt with. U-32 is being loaded with provisions. For submarine crews, food that's said to be good for the nerves is very important. So there's no shortage of soft drinks, chocolate, and hearty snacks. Where others see nothing but chaos, Lieutenant Commander Benjamin Beck has everything under control. This isn't chaos at all. Everyone knows exactly what to do and when and where to do it. It's teamwork. I don't think it's any different to when people bring their shopping home. Everything just stands around in the kitchen until it's all put away and it's just the same here. The diameter of this round access hatch is just about one meter. And now hundreds of liters of drinks, a good 220 kilos of meat, as well as boxes of vegetables have to be carried through it. The crew passes the food from hand to hand in what they call the supplies chain until it reaches the storage location. 320 kilos of fruit and vegetables and 300 kilos of frozen foods are taken on board. Ship's cook, Marcel Fiedler, puts the fresh goods into cold storage. Now we check the best before dates to make sure they'll last till the end of the trip, and then we know everything will be fine. Storing the supplies will take another few hours. The work on a submarine is often exhausting. First mate, Martin Zass, knows just how important it is to have foods for nerve health on board. All the sweet stuff and the drinks are essential, really, because they help lift the mood. We're not actually allowed to carry our own sweets with us on board, but just having a chocolate bar every so often is actually quite important. Otherwise, I think you definitely have people at each other's throats. I think you would have <laughs> a number of crates of beer are also stored on board, referred to affectionately by the crew as Wachblase, or watch relief. You can have a beer occasionally. Theoretically, every soldier is entitled to have two bottles of beer a day, but they rarely do. Hardly anyone drinks beer at sea, and it has to be sanctioned by the commander anyway. Nevertheless, sonar technician Philipp Engels looks forward to having the traditional beer on arriving at their destination. 
Every inch of free space on the cramped submarine is used for storing food and drinks. U-32 takes on provisions to last three weeks. Food and more food wherever you look. In a war situation, these torpedo tubes would contain torpedoes, but now they're being used as storage space, for beer in this case. One of the crew pushes the crates down to the end of the tube with his feet. So now, Pills beer is stored where otherwise deadly missiles would await their launch. It's definitely quite stressful. You can see that there's not a lot of space on a submarine, so you need to make sure that you don't take one big four kilo tin on board, but lots of little ones, as they're easier to store. Carton should really be left behind at the home port to reduce waste. So I take everything out of the packaging and just keep the instruction part that tells me how to do something and put that away somewhere. After six hours, all the food has been stored away. Marcel Fiedler takes a short break. Outside, scuba divers are getting ready. It's their job to check the submarines for explosives or damage below the waterline before they leave port. This is part of what the Underwater Close Combat Defense Unit does. The first dive always involves looking for limpet mines or anything else intended to prevent our departure. The search for deadly explosives and possible damage is routine procedure before every vessel leaves port, even in times of peace. The divers carefully examine the entire hull of the submarine meter by meter before moving on to check the anchor. All clear. They find neither damage nor limpet mines on the hull of U-32. Back at the base, Commander Rudolf Lente has called his officers together for the navigation briefing to discuss the precise route. U-32 will be sailing through the extremely busy areas of the Kiel Canal before passing through it. A major challenge for the young captain and his crew. There are 14 ferries in the area, and we don't have a precise schedule because they go back and forth all day long. There are eight bridges too, but they're all high enough at 42 meters, so we can easily pass under them. If you look at this point, here in particular, we don't have much space, so if any vessel comes toward us, we'll have to navigate very carefully. We'll operate special navigation here, meaning we won't just rely on technology, but navigate visually as well. The anchor is clear for dropping, so if worse comes to worst, we can halt the vessel on the spot immediately. The emergency rudder is also manned, so if there's a rudder failure, we can react as quickly as possible. Before U-32 can leave port, the crew has to make sure all technical devices are functioning properly. Chief Electronics Technician Christoph Strehle is carrying out the final checks. Bridge, periscope's up. U-32 has two periscopes. The larger observation periscope with a thermal imaging device and the smaller, more inconspicuous attack periscope. I'm now testing the various mechanisms in the periscope. That means I switch on when the rotary drive is connected, and this allows me to operate the periscope with this button here and rotate it. With this button here, I can check whether the horizontal angle works. That means we can go up and down. Now I simply adjust the height, switch on the zoom, and that's it. After months of preparation, the time has finally come. U-32 is about to leave port. The crew is ready. Now we've all gradually realized that we're actually going to see. 
Up to now, we haven't really had that feeling, even when packing our cases and things, because when you've done it so often, it just becomes routine at some point. But I think it's about time we get going. I'm looking forward to it. It's a kind of anticipation of what's to come. That's what we've been trained to do, so now, of course, we want to show that we can do it. The boat's ready for sea, and we're happy that we can finally leave and just go to sea again. Karalfa, fall in. Preparations are completed. The big day has arrived. We're heading to England on the maneuver we've been training for for months. So now we can show and we'll get through this maneuver very well. Good morning, Good morning Crew Alpha. Eyes front. Crew Alpha at ease. This is not fun and games. This is the way we'll do things. I'm the commander and that's why I have to tell you this. It's serious business, and if things go the way we want them to, it could even be fun at some point. Be prepared for this and be respectful and polite in the normal manner. Core Alpha, attention. Two maneuver stations. For 35-year-old Rudolf Lente, this is his first mission as commander. Everything now has to run smoothly. The crew is well trained, we've got everything on board, and already have our first information for the schedule next week. We're leaving port with a good feeling. The mission begins. U-32 leaves port. At maneuver stations, boat is ready to sail. Do we cast off? Yes, cast off. U-32 leaves the naval base at Eckernförde. The passage to England alone is a challenge for both vessel and crew. Eckernförde Bay. It stretches 17 kilometers inland. There are numerous marinas and jetties here, and a lot of traffic. U-32 constantly has to avoid other seagoing vessels, such as yachts and fishing boats. Using sonar, radar, and the periscopes, First Watch Officer Beck and its staff constantly observe their surroundings. We always use the periscopes just to compare the contacts we have on the radar because we can't say for sure whether the different blips on the radar, as we call them, are a vessel, a barrel, or just interference. A rain shower, for example, or a larger bird flying by can always show up briefly on the screen. U-32 is about to submerge and will then be virtually invisible for other skippers. The crew now has to be especially careful to avoid collisions. Crew, two diving stations. Two diving stations. The long drawn out intonation of the commands ensures the crew can recognize them from the melody. That's particularly important in emergency situations. The commander is the last person on the bridge before the submarine dives. He goes up once more to check whether the vessel's upper decks really are ready for diving. He alone is responsible for the safety of his crew. Only when the commander is satisfied that the submarine can dive safely does he return to the control room to give the order. Dive down to periscope depth. Dive down to periscope depth. The helmsman is responsible for course, speed, and depth. After the watch officer has given the command, the helmsman steers the submarine down to the given depth. U-32 begins to submerge.
For the submarine to submerge completely and go down to periscope depth takes 60 seconds. Seven meters. Yeah. U-32 has reached its periscope depth of 13.5 meters. Dive halted. Yeah. But how does diving work technically? Between the pressure hull and the outer hull, submarines have large ballast tanks. When the vessel is on the surface, they're filled with air. For diving, these tanks are flooded with water the submarine becomes heavier and it sinks. To resurface, the ballast tanks are filled with compressed air, which displaces the water in the tanks, allowing the submarine to surface. Using the periscope, Commander Lenta checks the surroundings to avoid any collisions. The periscopes are among the most essential items of equipment on board. We have two different ones. This one is the observation periscope. The difference is that the outlook head alone, the part that's above water surface, is much larger than the one on the front periscope. As you can hear, I keep getting messages that I have to answer, but there are communication points everywhere, so I can speak at any time. So this periscope has a much larger outlook head than the front periscope. We call this one here the observation periscope. With this observation periscope, we have a number of different devices. A thermal imaging device, which enables infrared vision, so we can use this periscope at night. And it also has radar to get out of the ship's bearings. The drawback is when the periscope is up, we're easier to find. So if we really only want to look through the periscope, we tend to take the front one because it's much smaller. The submarine crew constantly scans the environment, not only optically, but also acoustically. Sonar technician Philip Engels and his colleagues have to make sense of a mass of different engine sounds from boats and ships of all shapes and sizes. Fishermen are very interesting for us as you can often hear a winch or something like that. Various working noises are the sound of nets. You have to be able to differentiate a bit. If a fisherman is making these working noises, we are interested in how he's traveling and in what direction, so we don't cross behind him and can avoid the net somehow. Otherwise, we also have vehicles with lower rev speeds, 80 RPM propellers, for example. They are usually larger merchant vessels that we needn't worry about too much, since they just travel their normal routes from A to B, and so are much easier for us to avoid. A fisherman is constantly changing course, going right or left and maneuvering, so that's something we have to take a greater interest in. Yachts in particular present a big challenge. On sonar, they're scarcely audible. The sonar technician must be able to recognize all other seagoing vessels, such as fishing boats, freighters, passenger ships, or motorboats from their sound alone. If it's a merchant vessel, you can hear it better because they often have four blades in the propeller and one blade is always distinctive and sounds a bit like... You can hear that very clearly. Please check bearing 305. In its submerged state, U-32 is currently traveling at 5 knots, which is about 10 kilometers an hour. So far, everything's going smoothly. But then, an emergency announcement. 
practice drill. Fire on board. Fire on board. Sound insulation module on fire. Practice drill. Diesel engine on fire. Drive motor on pressure pump one. First steps initiated. As quickly as possible, the firefighting crew has to put on their protective clothing and gas masks. On all sections of the submarine ceiling, there are emergency air manifolds, which the fire crew can connect to. The commander is putting his crew to the test. He wants to know exactly how resilient they are. This may be only a drill, but advancing through the narrow corridors to the stern of the submarine, wearing full protective gear and oxygen masks is an extremely strenuous task. In a real situation, first mate Martin Zas would have already extinguished the fire, but here he is simulating smoke poisoning and has to be rescued as quickly as possible. Despite the urgency, the fire crew transport the victim with extreme care. The injured man is taken to the officer's mess, which has meanwhile been converted into a sick bay. This is where he will be stabilized. To the commander, injured first mate Sass has arrived at sick bay. First aid measures initiated, starting treatment. Oxygen mask? Yes. Give the full 12 liters. No, the oxygen mask. Check the blood pressure. You've just taken the pulse? Okay, then connect the pulse oximeter, the yellow one, just to check the oxygen saturation, and then we'll insert another cannula. Diagnosis, suspected smoke inhalation. He's still unconscious. We assume he's inhaled smoke. We're just stabilizing him now, and then he'll leave the vessel. Rescued. But that was only a drill. The injured man's doing well now. The treatment was successful. But nevertheless, if he had really received the injuries we've just simulated, Mr. Sass would definitely have had to be taken from board, in peacetime at least. We'd have requested a helicopter to get Mr. Sass off the submarine and taken to a hospital on land. In war, the injured man could not have been taken off the vessel. Whether he would have survived under those circumstances is not clear. Yeah. The drill just now went very well. The soldiers did exactly what I expected of them. They worked fast and fully focused, and this gives me confidence about actually continuing on our way to this maneuver. Ship's cook, Marcel Fiedler, is busy in the galley. The trained chef learned his trade in a restaurant kitchen on land. And even after seven years, he still finds cooking on board a submarine can be a challenge sometimes. When we're doing practice drills like water or fire on board, that reduces the time frame and things get pretty tight. Then you just have to do one thing after another to make sure the meals are ready on time and that the food is warm and everything's ready at exactly the right time. Because it's such a small room here, plus the smell of the food and the ship is rocking, it doesn't take long for me to get seasick. So that's a bit of a problem for me and for the crew as well. If that sometimes makes it difficult to get meals ready on time. Each crew member should consume about 3,000 kilocalories a day. The lack of space on board allows little room for exercise. So the cook needs to make sure that the soldiers don't put on too much weight. A healthy, balanced diet is what's required. But the crew have other preferences. It doesn't matter if it's breakfast, lunch or dinner, or even the mid-watch meals at night. It's all a question of what you're looking forward to, whether oncoming watch or offgoing watch. And if there's really no meat or something's wrong with the food, it puts everyone in a bad mood and the whole atmosphere on board can change quickly. So like I say, the cook's got a really important job. An important and a hard job because ship's cook is the only position without any backup. He's at work almost round the clock. It's timed so that we do six-hour shifts, so there are meals every six hours. At 5.20, there's breakfast, 
1120 is the first sitting for lunch, and then there's dinner at 1920, and at around 2330 there's the mid-watch meal, and that's the way it goes day after day. In a few minutes, Chef Marcel Fiedler will be taking a good hour's break. In the control room, Wiebke Ludwig is preparing for the submarine to surface. She's the marine engineer officer. To the commander, the low deck is clear to surface. Seven millibars over pressure. Surfacing maneuver. Oh. Surfacing. Oh. Surfacing. Twelve meters. Eleven meters. De-ballasting. De-ballasting. De-ballasting fills the ballast tanks with compressed air, which then displaces the water in the tanks, making the submarine lighter than the water so the vessel can resurface. Make the bridge ready for sea. The German Navy has six submarines. They are all of the 212A class and are mainly deployed for reconnaissance and the presentation of operational situations. No German submarine has sunk since 1966. Life as a submariner is meanwhile relatively safe, but with lots of restrictions. Sonar technician Philip Engels doesn't have much luggage, but he always has a little more than many of his colleagues. Because I have to be up on the bridge, I need to take a few more pairs of pants, as there's always the chance of a wave coming over. So I have the ones I'm wearing and four others. Um, that should be enough. Here I've got my mother's homemade jam. That's very important because you can't go anywhere without something to remind you of home. It brings the images to mind and jam's always special. Something you had for breakfast at home. Or I don't know, some people bring a cuddly toy from home just so they have something. And apart from that, I don't have that many things with me. Submariners are often cut off from their families and friends for weeks, but at least on board, they're never alone. The crew becomes a replacement family, up to 30 people in a very small space, sharing 21 beds. Having your own place to sleep is luxury. This is my bed here, or as we say, my bunk, and I share it with first mate Kirchner, he's the other sonar technician on board. There are four of us all together, and he's in the other watch. We're divided up into starboard and port watches, and we change over every six hours. But such close proximity isn't always pleasant. There are some, of course, who don't bring enough shoes and then have smelly feet. You get that sometimes, but it's not too bad. When you're really tired and have to sleep, you can. It's something you can put up with. Of course, you do mention to your comrade that he might want to do something about it, either by bringing a few more pairs of shoes along or using the foot spray that we have especially for this. That might help a little. Only one person on board is occasionally allowed the luxury of a little privacy. Commander Rudolf Lente. I'm the only one lucky enough to have my own room, so to speak. I can close the door and actually have a bit of peace and quiet. Along with the marine engineer officer and others on permanent watch, I'm on call all the time. If anything happens or goes wrong, I'm always the person to contact. That's why I have something special here, my own communicator. 
So if I'm actually asleep in here and someone needs to contact me, I have something that I can speak through. Basically, I have a little more storage space than the others. This here might suggest that I have lots of shelf space, but I don't. Because like everywhere else on board, there's technology in here, so I can't put anything inside. So I only have a few small compartments. But one interesting thing is that under my little bed is where our weapons and ammunition is stored, and I sleep on them. I'm not the only one with a key, but this is where we keep them. But apart from that, it's actually quite a comfortable place to sleep. But things are not usually comfortable on board for very long. Rudder failure, rudder failure, steering console failed. Rudder put in emergency operation. Rudder failure. This means the rudder can no longer be controlled from the control room. In this area, there's a lot of shipping. A collision would be a disaster. Helmsman Marco Baltok now has to get to the emergency rudder in the stern as quickly as possible. In busy areas, the emergency rudder is always manned. Marco Baltok now takes over communications with the control room. The submarine's large X-shaped rudder is now being controlled manually using the four levers. Changing course to starboard, evasive action to avoid fishing boats ahead. Fast, evasive action is needed to prevent a collision. 1,500 tons of steel are maneuvered manually away from the other vessel. We carry out these exercises relatively often, and I wouldn't really want to experience it in a genuine emergency. But if it happens, it would be no problem to get to the back and steer the vessel from here. The first stage is completed. Fresh air again at last. After four hours, U-32 has reached the Kiel Fjord. The crew now prepares to enter the Holtenau Lock. The gateway to the Kiel Canal. This federal inland waterway is the busiest man-made waterway for seagoing vessels in the entire world. A tugboat is already waiting to help the submarine through the narrow entrance. Members of the crew attach a tow rope to the stern of the U-32. The tugboat will accompany the submarine on its entire passage through the Kiel Canal. The 400 million euro steel colossus sails into the lock. Not an easy task since U-32 isn't particularly maneuverable and in the narrow lock, collisions can easily occur. Once the submarine is moored, it's then just a matter of waiting. The rise of no more than half a meter here takes around 30 minutes. The tugboat constantly pulls the stern of the submarine into the middle of the lock to prevent the rudder touching the side wall. If it were to be damaged, the mission would end right here and the cost would be enormous. The giant lock gate opens again, but the 56-meter submarine can't leave its position just like that. A second tugboat is needed. Carefully and with a little difficulty, it pulls the U-32 out of the lock. The entire procedure takes one hour. A newcomer on board is the pilot, who will guide the vessel through the Kiel Canal. He knows the area very well and advises the commander. Since 1948, the Kiel Canal, also known as the Nord Ossee Canal, or NOK, has connected the Baltic Sea with the North Sea at the Elbe Estuary. 
More than 32,000 ships pass through it every year. In the canal, U-32 sails without the tug. Top speed is eight knots, around 15 kilometers an hour. The slower the U-boat travels, the more difficult it is to steer it. Passing through this busy canal requires maximum concentration from all involved. There are a lot of bends here, more than we normally have. And we have to negotiate these bends so that we don't interfere with oncoming traffic. And in general, it's fair to say that the NOK is quite narrow compared to other waterways that we know. The 100-kilometer waterway runs through the picturesque landscape of Schleswig-Holstein. First mate, Martin Zass, is enjoying his short break on deck. When you stand here, you can really enjoy having a bit of time to yourself. But even up on the tower, when you're out at sea, it's great to have some time in your hands. Yeah, I've always dreamt of working on a submarine. I grew up with it to some extent, because my father was on a submarine back then, and I wanted to do so too. That's why I joined the Navy. And I would have been a bit disappointed if I hadn't been posted on a submarine. U-32 has now been traveling through the Kiel Canal for three hours. The time is 1,700 hours. Time for sonar technician Philipp Engels to get some sleep. His first shift is now over. We are here in the upper head. That's the toilet. And for me, it's time to go to sleep. We can sleep now for about three hours before we are woken up again. In submarine jargon, head means toilet, and there are only two of them on board. We have two bathrooms, well, that's what I'll call them, for around 30 people. And whenever the watch changes, you've got 12 to 15 people all going to brush their teeth, get washed, have a shower, go to the toilet all at once. So sometimes there's a bit of a line at the heads, and then people get in each other's way. You just have to wait your turn. Sonar technician Engels will now sleep for three hours before his next shift begins. Oh, good night. Good night. Ship's cook Marcel Fiedler can only take short breaks. Well, I've slept for a good one and a half hours now. And I'm at the stage where I've prepared part of the mid-watch meal, like the kebab meat here. It's a tradition on submarines that when they leave port, the crew gets kebab. No idea why. That was well before my time, so I'm just carrying on the tradition. Why kebab after leaving port? A mystery. Just like so many other traditions and the German submariners' very own language. Setting the table here is referred to as baking it. And once it's been baked, they can bench, meaning sit down and eat their meal. Baking and benching takes place every six hours, and the ship's cook works almost around the clock. I've prepared 136 meals for the crew today. At dinner in the officer's mess, Commander Lente is absent. He has to stay on the bridge until the submarine has successfully passed through the canal. And depending on how busy it is, the journey can take up to 15 hours. Every now and then, there are places in the canal that allow me to go below deck. And since we had to wait in the Kiel Fjord a bit longer today, I had time to eat below. Otherwise, I would have eaten up here. Quite a lot of oncoming traffic this evening. Things are a bit busy in the canal today. For the helmsman, that means he'll need to be especially careful. But the boat can, of course, move slightly to the left or to the right if anything comes towards us. 
As helmsman, first mate Martin Zas is currently sitting at the steering console, guiding the submarine through the canal with great concentration. Even the slightest course deviation could be catastrophic. In a multi-million euro simulator, prospective submarine helmsmen learn not to make mistakes in such situations. They're trained to steer class 212A submarines on identical controls and equipment. We have this simulator which also works with a motion system so it can display everything very realistically, including malfunctions, environmental influences, all kinds of things. For training our future steering console operators or depth control officers, we know that here people are allowed to make mistakes, and that's what we want to provoke, but they're not allowed to make any on board. Every submariner, from the cook to the commander, has to go through this training program, just like 22-year-old Christian Petersen. At first, when we came in here, I remember that in the first few hours, none of us could control the submarine. We just went up and down uncontrollably and caused problems that were completely off the charts. But meanwhile, we more or less managed to come to grips with it. Only very few get through the demanding training course and actually become submarine helmsmen. Back in the Kiel Canal. Ship's cook Marcel Fiedler is preparing the night meal, the so-called mid-watch. Even in an experienced submariner like him, the first signs of fatigue are beginning to show. You feel most tired when you've been in a deep sleep and then have to get up to make the mid-watch or the dough for the breakfast rolls. I'd say that's when you feel quite groggy. And then you really look forward to just being able to take a shower and get off the boat. Marcel Fiedler can now lie down for about an hour before he then has to serve the night meal. U-32 will soon reach the Brunsbüttel Lock. The journey through the canal has taken eight hours. Commander Lente has been on the bridge the whole time. How long have I been here? I'd have to check, but it definitely seems like quite a long time. So far, I've just been up here as an officer on watch, so I could get someone to relieve me, but I feel fine. We have another 45 minutes here in the canal before we reach Brunsbüttel, and then we'll have made it. We only need to go down the Elbe, and then my day's finished. That's a good 18 to 20 hours, if I'm not mistaken. The new commander is very satisfied with his crew. And sonar technician Philip Engels is proud to be part of it. There are more Bundesliga footballers in Germany than submariners. At the moment, we've got about 80 active submarine personnel, which isn't a lot. So it seems that you've obviously got to work hard to make it. And you have to really want to do it. Coming on board here and not being fully committed wouldn't be any good at all, so you might as well forget it. Passing through the Kiel Canal, Crew Alpha and their commander, Rudolf Lente, have mastered the first stage of their operation. U-32 will soon set course for England, where a NATO maneuver is planned. From now on, their mission will be top secret.